on today's World Insight with Tian Wei. American companies who bear the brunt of the China-U.S. war over tariffs. How are they coping? And the pursuit of beauty in film costumes and scene designs. That's with Oscar winner Tim Yip of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon fame. <laughs> Always a problem. And welcome to World Insight with me, Tianwei. The program is coming to you live on CGTN. After several rounds of trade consultation, it seems that the world's two largest economies are back at square one, some say. Making matters worse, the trade friction is now taking a toll on the world economy. Americans, too, are feeling the heat from the shimmering battle of tariffs. America's false narrative on China. An article from Stephen Roach, a senior fellow and lecturer at Yale University, after Washington announced a tariff hike to 25 percent on Chinese goods worth 200 billion U.S. dollars. In the article, he said Washington has been loose with facts, analysis, and conclusions, and the American public has been far too gullible in its acceptance of this false narrative. Sadly, fixating on scapegoats is apparently much easier than taking a long, hard look in the mirror. After the 11th round of discussions between the U.S. and China in Washington on May 9 and 10, Chinese Vice Premier Liu Ha said both sides are willing to move forward with the talks. However, Washington announced new plans, shaking confidence in the progress of consultations. Experts say tariffs on both Chinese and U.S. goods will harm the interests of U.S. companies and consumers and will ultimately hurt the U.S. economy. Despite what President Trump says, claiming that the Chinese uh, pay tariffs on Chinese imports to the United States, it's actually the U.S. consumers and businesses that, that pay. Tariffs are a tax. They're a tax on imports. And so the, receiving, the receiver of those goods are the ones that pay that tax. And again, that's the U.S. consumers and businesses. We have to be able to make a profit and at least break even. And where we're at today, for the next four to five years, I don't see that happening until we have this... Uh, uh, trade war uh, settled. As a nonprofit, we never thought tariffs would affect us, but they do. President Trump says that China is paying these tariffs, but I see the cost on my invoices. A 10% increase in the tariff means that 10% more babies are at risk. President Trump, stop the trade war now. The Chinese Commerce Ministry said the impact of the trade spat with the U.S. on China's economy is manageable. Beijing will keep an eye on the nation's economic indicators and take necessary measures to stabilize the economy. The Chinese government vowed to protect the legitimate rights of foreign companies in China and maintain a stable, fair, transparent and predictable business environment for them. So, what's the impact of ramped up trade tensions between China and the U.S. on company strategies? Let's turn to our panelists for the first round of discussion. In our Beijing studio, Tim Stratford, the chairman of AmCham here in China. Welcome, sir. Also joining us here, uh, Jacob Parker, vice president of China operations from the U.S. China Business Council. Welcome as well. Let me go to you first, uh, because you just traveled to Washington on a annual door knock campaign. What have you found out when you were talking and what was the atmosphere in Washington? Well, we were there before the trade talks really fell apart. Um, and so there was great optimism that we were about to have a, a, have a deal. And so it was really at the end of the week when we were all surprised to see the sudden negative turn of events. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we, we talked to 20 members of the Senate we talked to people at uh, different branches of the executive branch, talked to people in think tanks, and by and large, uh, people were encouraged with the progress in the trade talks, and we were already looking ahead to how are we going to implement them, uh, implement any agreement in a smooth way. And so I think we've been, we've been very disappointed to see the breakdown. Mm. It's not unusual for there to be hiccups at the end of a negotiation mm -hmm. like this. You know, each side sort of has to test the other to make sure they're getting the best deal. The U.S. does that, China does that. But what's particularly troubling right now is that a lot of the, um, the testing seems yeah. to be going on in a very public way 
and that kind of corners each side from a political point of view and makes it harder to compromise. So that's what we're, we're most disappointed to. Mm. And of course, uh, Jacob, you've been staying in China, working closely with your members. What exactly is the ambience right now, in a way, when you talk to them and their top concerns and challenges as they see it? So I, I think our members have been extremely concerned and surprised about when the president's tweet was announced. Um, the increase of tariffs of the original batch and then the additional 300 billion in tariffs that were announced for public comment were both very concerning. Some of the anecdotes we've heard from companies, uh, one, it has shown their customers in the China market that perhaps their supply and cost is not reliable. Mm -hmm. So we've heard many of those customers are beginning to look at European and Japanese and domestic suppliers in some cases to ensure a consistency of supply both from a price perspective and then also just from a, an import perspective. Uh, we've also heard from some companies that just generally the uncertainty around the tariffs and the potential for them to increase in the future has made them pause on their investment decisions in the China market and reevaluate the risk of their supply chains in the China market. I see. So now for new investments, they're looking Southeast Asia, Mexico, other places as a result of these tariffs. Well, of course, none of those markets is as big as what we are talking about here in China still. Another layer of complication, of course, is about Huawei. Uh, with the uh, executive order came on earlier and then the Commerce Department announcement. But I'm not going to the government side because none of you is representing the U.S. government. But Certainly, many of the companies that Huawei is getting its supplies of components and parts from are members of your company. Qualcomm, Broadcom, uh, Google, Microsoft, just to name a few. 11 billion, according to the latest uh, reports in some media reports, about Huawei spending on the uh, suppliers from the U.S. side. So to you, Tim, what would that mean? for companies, not only your members, but also companies as a whole, thinking about the potential? Well, I've, of course, it, it greatly complicates the, the business plans that these companies had. Um, one of the things that concerns us is the broader impact. Not only is there an, uh, uh, an economic impact, but um, you know, we see many of our Chinese partners uh, in China who don't understand what the U.S. is doing, and it's very difficult for them to not come to the conclusion that the real goal of the United States is not just trying to have a more level playing field in terms of economic policy, but actually to try to uh, contain and curtail China's economic and technological development. And so far, there hasn't been enough information presented by the U.S. government that has uh, been persuasive to, to let people think that there was some, you know, strong, legitimate national mm -hmm. security purpose behind this. We just don't have that information, and so a lot of people are coming to a very negative conclusion about the U.S.'s intentions. Mm. It's not only the you, the business community, not know. Uh, if I remember right, there are those on the Capitol Hill who have been also complaining about what about the recent policy-making process in Washington and whether they should be informed about what exactly is going on to you, uh, Jacob. The same question, rather. Um, if one government is doing things like this to another company from another country, then there could be enough reasons for the others to act in similar logic, uh, which is to disturb the global supply chain. So I guess that's probably an even bigger danger than just one company itself, yeah. in a way. Because your members are all operating globally. That's right. They're multinational companies. That's right. Um, I think that we've seen two impacts just over the last two days, and it's still too early to say what the full implications sure. are going to be. The first is obviously companies will begin to lose business with Huawei, not just in the China market, but wherever they operate around the world, because Huawei being added to the entity list, if that's fully executed on uh, this week as we expect it to mm. be, or next week as we expect it to be, then, then they will no longer be able to sell to them. That'll be a big cut in their business overnight. Uh, I think the other concern is the potential retaliatory actions that China might take, and those may be obvious or, or less obvious. I'll give you an example that one of our companies told us today. Uh, they were in a long-term negotiation with a state-owned enterprise who had a public tender uh, for the acquisition of a certain semiconductor product. And unfortunately, at the very end, when they thought they would win that tender, just over the last 
few days, mm. it's ended up falling through, and they've been unable to contact anyone at the company, and they've heard private discussions with some of the people involved that uh, they're no longer considered to be a stable supplier because of the risk of this kind of entity issue mm. coming up in the future. Mm. Of course, it's a lot of... Uh headaches for people like you who are trying to represent the interests of uh, American companies operating globally, particularly here in China. Uh, before I bring in another speaker, can I ask both of you another legitimate question, which is, despite of the lobbying efforts, the explanations, the discussions, communications that both of your organizations have been put into, uh, in terms of your communication with Washington, particularly the current administration, Really, do you still matter to the policies going on right now in Washington? Or you being listened but not heard at all? I, I think the key to our being heard is to understand what are the problems that the U.S. administration thinks they're trying to address and make sure that the solutions that we propose will also make sense to them in terms of the things that they're worried about. Mm. Um, one of the big problems we have, we have uh, policy differences between the U.S. and China on economic matters, and then we also have national security concerns that each country has about the other. So that's quite natural, but those are two very different policy areas, and they have different rationales, they have different government agencies that are in charge of them, and, uh, and if you don't separate those two policy areas out and explain exactly what you're doing, it's very easy for everything to be a jumbled mess mm. and everything's unpredictable. So for example, yeah. Huawei is a national security situation. Uh, at least that's the rationale that's being given. And under those cases, it may be appropriate to go after a particular company, but you have to define national security very narrowly and you should only do that if you, very ha if you have a very strong yeah. reason to do so. And the, the U.S. government recently has define national security in very broad ways yeah. that, that can interfere with the executive order talking about foreign adversaries even though it's not being interpreted clearly and therefore anybody can use the policy to portray their own interests if they want to in a way. Uh, Jacob, to you. I would say it's really important to understand how we got to this position mm. and organizations like ours are completely aligned with the Trump administration's goals of trying to correct some of the challenges that our companies experience in the China market. It's true that we disagree with some of the tactics that are being employed, but I, I think from some of our members' perspectives, those tactics are beginning to get some results. All right, we'll see what, how things would play out. That's why we need to have another layer of our discussion. Later, there will be a Chinese guest also joining us. But for now, it is not just the business community, but also the academic community that are having some different views uh, compared to what's going on right now with the policies coming from Washington. Yale University's uh, Stephen Roach, for example, he has been a long time uh, uh, China hand, as some say. He sounded the alarm over the wholly blaming China for America's economic challenges, many of them self-inflicted according to him. Take a look. He set the record straight that trade deficits are a direct result of shrinking domestic savings in the U.S. owing to big U.S budget deficit. He also noted supply chain distortions that makes the China-U.S. trade imbalance seem bigger. And he said it seemed much easier to paint China as the villain in making America great again. And more on this, we are joined by a Chinese panelist as well. He's coming from the academic circle in Hong Kong, Mr. Xiao Geng, professor at Peking University HSBC Business School based in Hong Kong. Professor Xiao, you've been attentively listening over the past few minutes to your two colleagues here in Beijing studio. From your academic perspective, is there much chance that the two countries will be able to have a deal if act reasonably from both sides? Well, I think the uh, deal still uh, is possible uh, since uh, actually uh, trade war is going to hurt both sides. And I think the uh, uh, U.S., of course, will lose trade war, uh, just like uh, China, you know. And uh, that doesn't make any sense to uh, either politicians or the American people. So sooner or later, uh, the two sides will find a way to deal with uh, the trade, which is actually easier. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the, the question is, uh, 
uh, the, the so-called the national security uh, shadow price, you know, uh, I mean, national security is a concern mm -hmm. for those countries. But the question is how much you want to pay. And uh, I think uh, through uh, the trade wars which happened, uh, I mean, actions in last uh, few days, few weeks, uh, each side are uh, testing uh, the, the cost and, mm. uh, and how much, you know, each side can actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, bail absorb, cost, rather uh, digest so in a way. So, yeah. uh, to you, uh, Professor Xiao, since the other two guests have already <coughs> spoken about this, how much chance is there in the short term that the two sides, particularly the negotiation teams, will be able to come together? Which, of course, is the next step before the next step happens. I mean, well, I, I think uh, the, the key is for both leaders, uh, you know, both uh, you know leaders to realize that. Uh, uh, there's no way China and the United States uh, uh, can separate each other uh, in trade. In uh, you know the, those uh, you know every day there are two billion uh, trade going on. You know, uh, and uh, any disruptions is going to uh, cut the, the supply chain. You know, uh, around the world. And, and that, that's a problem uh, you know, which is going to lead to even mm. bigger problem uh, in terms of, you know, uh, both countries' people, you know, and uh, companies. Yeah, so there will be reactions from people and the companies. But probably that's your thought. Uh, maybe so some of the policy makers do not necessarily agree with you. Uh, Jacob, uh, many say the Huawei issue, you don't have to comment on a specific company, just the, the issue itself. That is a attempt to decouple the two economies because you see a lot of companies working with one another in this overall ecosystem that is related to Huawei. And not to mention some of the other tech cooperations because that is one of the most important cooperation between China and the United States, even money-wise. So, uh, Jake, what were your thoughts here? I think it's important to make a distinction between the business community, which under no circumstances supports this idea of decoupling, mm. and perhaps some very narrow attitudes that are existing in the administration. Mm. And those attitudes certainly have a, a perspective on China today that perhaps it's a strategic threat, perhaps we need to do more to protect the United States, and that's part of the rationale, I think, behind what led us to uh, the position today. But I can tell you that the business community sees globally integrated supply chains yeah. as a critical part of their global competitiveness and ensuring that American consumers and Chinese consumers continue to receive the best price for their products, and they will continue to advocate for that going forward. Mm. And of course, uh, that what's going on in the administration is forever a puzzle for all of us uh, watching from outside, uh, because there were reports talking about certain factions working together against others. Uh, there is personal interactions and chemistry going on. Uh, Tim, I don't want you to give us the definite answer because I don't think you know it either. But the fact that there are uncertainties uh, from that perspective, uh, po politically speaking, what would that mean for a later stage if there were any discussion from both sides about a deal? Yeah. I, I think that in both governments, uh, I, I think the U.S. government is more visible about how things work just because of different systems, but I think in both governments there's a lively debate about how closely can the two countries cooperate and how much do they trust each other. If you talk about national security, both countries have legitimate national security concerns, and so, uh, but based on my experience, governments are very good at finding problems, but they're not always the best at figuring out the best solution. Mm -hmm. And I think there needs to be uh, a close collaboration with the technical experts that you have in companies to figure out how to address the legitimate interests of the, of the governments, but to maximize the amount of business that yeah. our two countries can do together. Mm -hmm. But you know, at this point, with the uncertainties that all of us agree exist right now, what about the economies to, you know, the economic potential of the two economies, China and the U.S.? To you, Professor Xiao, I probably would ask about China's because you're a China scholar. Uh, now we heard the National Commission of Reform have been talking about the necessary steps could be taken to uh, further enhance the growth of the economy. We also heard from the Commerce Department here in China about the potential of China's economic growth. So what do you make of the current uncertainties and the uh, capability of China to maintain its growth and also to maintain its trade status with other economies under the current circumstances, Professor Xiao. 
Well, I think uh, for the last few years, China has been uh, pushing all kind of reforms. And uh, so uh, uh, I think uh, in terms of further opening and also reduction of uh, some of the uh, costs, uh, th this will uh, continue. And because of the uh, international situations, uh, the, the outside pressures, so a lot of reforms will come out much faster and much uh, forceful. So in terms of the Chinese economy, uh, I think the key drivers is actually domestic demand. So mm -hmm. uh, that means that the trade is actually not so important now, uh, given uh, the massive pressures and powers uh, you know, Chinese households already have. But it is also confidence a lot that's of important. Infrastructure. The confidence in the economy is very important. Yeah, the confidence is important, but the confidence actually depends on, uh, uh, in a way, uh, how the government uh, will handle this issue. Mm. And uh, the government uh, is now very clear, you know, it wants to support the uh, private sector and want to keep opening. Uh, and also a lot of policies will uh, be more stable uh, and uh, long lasting. Uh, so this will gradually, I think, uh, help to restore the confidence. I see. Because the Chinese economy today is then driven uh, by domestic uh, demand and domestic investment. That's true. What about the U.S. economy? Some say, even though you are not an economist yourself, but from the business perspective, uh, Tim, uh, the administration have given a lot of incentives to boost the economy, probably using the, all the tools in the box already. So what about next year, which is even more crucial for political purposes, uh, will the U.S. economy be able to, under the current uncertainties, still thrive? Uh, what does that mean, the uncertainty involving the economy, economic growth, for the current negotiations, to say the least? Tim? Well, um, certainly the current negotiations are a damper on a lot of economic activity. Uh, in AmCham, 65 percent of our members have said that they're reevaluating their China strategy. Uh, almost a third said that they're uh, delaying or postponing investment decisions. And so there's economic activity that would be positive for the U.S. and for China that is being um, delayed because of these uncertainties. Um, the two governments have made a remarkable ac effort over the last year to negotiate. These are the most intensive negotiations mm. that we've seen in a whole generation since China joined the WTO. And uh, the business community wants the governments to finish the job. There are real problems that have to be addressed, but the governments can reach an agreement, mm. and that's what we want them to do. You know, yeah. They need to get through the, peri the current rough period, they need to get back to the negotiating table, and they need to capitalize on all the hard work both sides have been doing if they can or they see there's a chance for both of them. Uh, Jacob, to you as well about that question and also the fact that the world is not just about China and the U.S. There are other players, important ones as well, Europeans, for example. And within the European continent, there's France, Germany, big economies. You also see that in Japan, an Asian economy, Australia. So what about apparently an evolving world that it is not a clear cut anymore. You are my allies and therefore I will always be listening to you. But rather, it seems that economies are having a very clear mind these days, trying to make their own decision. What does that mean overall to you as a business? I, I think that most other countries should have a vote in this process. This can't just be a U.S.-China issue. This is a global issue that affects all countries that are involved, and we need more involvement from those countries going forward. Mm. Well, we are running out of time, gentlemen. I know this is a very important discussion. I'm sure when things evolve, we're going to have all of you come back to our studio once again to share your insights and your wisdom. Thank you so much for your sincerity and also your thoughts. Uh, Jacob Parker, Tim Stratford, and Xiao Gang. Really appreciate it, gentlemen. Thank you. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program, the pursuit of beauty in film costumes and scene design. That's with Oscar winning Tim Yip of Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon fame. Okay, that that, that really interview really right really after this break, how he's cool. making a very different stage of his life as an artist.
Welcome back. You're still watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live on CGTN. Art is timeless, as they say, and today we will talk about timeless beauty in the movie pictures with Tim Yip. Tim Yip is a Chinese film art director and designer. He has worked on custom design, visual, and contemporary art. Since working on his first film, A Better Tomorrow, directed by John Woo in 1986, he has done custom designs and art direction for many films and theatrical performances. Besides working with Wu, Tim has collaborated with other well-respected film directors, such as An Li and Li Shaohong. He's best known for his works on the 2000 martial arts film Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, for which he won the Oscar for Best Art Direction and Costume Design and British Academy Film Award for Best Costume Design. Earlier, at a solo exhibition called Tim Yip Mira, in Beijing. He told me what it was like working with all of these well-known film directors and also the different stages of him as an artist. I think Andy is very interesting because when uh, we worked together in Counting Tiger Hidden Dragon and one day uh, we, we shooting is about how Yu Jiao Rong to slow run the Qingming Jian. Mm. After that experience, I feel we are the same person. Because uh, at the time when we, when we talk about how to shoot the shot, and then they the, uh, the photographer and, and, the, and the master art, master, master art, and then they, they bring it together to, to see, because they are from Hong Kong. Yes. They say, you know, the, the camera is just like one. They just open the window, take out the window, and, and fall in, and then get the, uh, and get the story. As they usually do. Uh. But uh, I stop them, mm -hmm. and I say, because at that time, they don't have this kind of window. The window has to be closed all the time. Only, win only window open is the upper window because in the Beijing they have a uh, stand, yeah. too many stand and wind, you know, so that they do it this way. And then they feel really angry. They say, you, you don't know movie. Movie have to fast. Have to but because they are more elder than me a lot, so I... Uh, and at that time, I, I sit there. I sit down. I don't compromise. <laughs> And any feel really difficult, and they they all wondering uh, tomorrow I, we are not coming, the kind of thing, and then uh, I sit down, and any come come to me and ask me, is it real, is it the uh, the building is like that, is it a real historical building like that, I mean that this is palace, palace is must be have the rules of the building, we we pay more many attention on how to build a set, we cannot do something wrong, <laughs> and then. The next day, I, I come to I come to the set, and I find that uh, they're shooting in in the late morning, late afternoon. They they separate into three three angles, and you generally is jumping up until the window and come down until the window and come up. Is it difficult to find someone like you who really cares? I think almost <laughs> not that much. Yeah. And also with Shao Hong, a female mm. uh, director for you know TV series yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Shao Hong is, is really crazy too. She's like a military general. He said, and sometimes he she believes in something that more than me. It's like I think, oh, this have to go back a little bit, but she's just running straight to it. So we just we will keep the really good friendship. Yeah, yeah. But you have been expanding your mm. area. Yeah. You so much experimented mm -hmm. as this exhibition has beautifully yeah. demonstrated. I'm doing in America, I'm doing work in um, Europe. I, I try to learn how they're doing things. I, I give you an example. Uh, I work with Afghan Khan. The last work is we d we're doing the ballet Giselle. <laughs>
at the verb of war. I'm showing my work, there's a war flowing like this. They love it. Just only one is the technical people. Technical people feel nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> they always feel nightmare when they're working with you. <laughs> but the interesting is all the people, the artistic director, everyone yeah, loves everyone it. Everyone loves it. Just love it. And then um, I know that they have some problem. Really difficult because it's expensive, because of the, the safety, you know, many issues. And I, and I try to be there all the meeting to talk to the technical people. And they say, oh, this one say cannot do it. The vendor say cannot do it, but I will ask another vendor to come. <laughs> I make sure that they will do it. But Akram also makes sure they, they will do it. So that everyone is the same heart. You're on the same page. Yeah, and then when, when I'm coming back, one day Akram sent me a video. I, I feel so moving because I see the, the role moving. <laughs> they do it. They just make it. And I, I find it really, te really terrible happy. And, and then when I come back to see the rehearsal, it's amazing. It's amazing. I can see the lights in your eyes when you're still recounting it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, one after another work, you cooperate with the others. Yes. But it's for them. Yeah. Uh, so how would you balance that, the role of accommodating yeah. and the role of creation? For me, it's more easy because I have a really open heart. Yes. I, I, I try to be a Chinese, a good Chinese. A good Chinese never can. What is a good Chinese? I want to <laughs> learn. Tell me more about it. <laughs> yeah, I think good Chinese should be calm. You take care of everything but don't show anything. In Hong Kong, I have some good friends who also really hiding. And then they work, they work everything. They don't get a war, they don't, they don't but, okay. but they can feel, but they can feel the beauty. They, mm. they, love, they love the beauty, yeah. the kind of beauty. You certainly always have something Chinese in a way, even mm -hmm. though it's very hard yeah, to say yeah. what Chinese-ness is. Yeah. I think I'm one of the artists that know Chinese, I guess, because I know the thing behind the simple. It's invisible force. Mm, with you to a certain extent, you will disappear yourself. And then you just see the things and you don't see yourself. You don't see the shape. So that you can be anything. But you feel the essence of it. That you can be anything. You will go inside anything and you get out. You, you don't take anything away. What is beauty to you, Tim? I think it's the kind of Chinese elegant, right? The kind of elegant. Chinese elegant is different from uh, the West. Because the West is, is also always is you have to be educated if you want to be elegant. But Chinese know you have to be um, mm, demonstrate yourself, you have to practice yourself. Practice the peace in your mind and practice the speak. <laughs> you have to be fast and you have to be silent at the same time. It takes me ages to get there. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say after talking to you, I work hard on that. Fun person, isn't it? In his earlier work, Tim introduced his concept of so-called New Orientalism aesthetics, making him an important artist in helping the world see the beauty of Chinese culture and art. The solo exhibition called the Tim Yip Mirror offers us a long reflection on Tim Yip's artistic journey over the years and reveals his unique understanding of the future. He's been active in a wide range of artistic disciplines, such as film production, costume designs, visual arts, and scenic design. He has tirelessly explored the so-called New Orientalism aesthetics by breaking the boundaries of blended art forms like photography, video, sculpture, and installation. I guess the best way to explain it is from him. What is Tim? Who is Tim? Is he that naughty boy with different sides of his personality flying around <laughs> just to have fun and poking people <laughs> with works like this? I think you, you, you know more than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope at the end of the day, but you know, who is that person? And how did he reach where he is mm -hmm. today? Uh, I, I think when I was really little, I started to join, always join. And at that time, I think I always uh, feeling different world. 
and become I, I will really deep uh, interest in mythologies and everything. At the very beginning, I want to be a painter, and I paint a lot in, in my in my school. And I because by painting, I get a chance to do the better tomorrow, that time. And afterwards, I my brother is a photographer, is fashion photographer. So that I love to do his work, mm -hmm. and then I, I I also be a fashion photographer. Which is better? Your drawing of his work or his works themselves? Fashion <laughs> photographer is better because you see many beautiful people. Yeah, so uh, painter is so alone at, at the time. But I, I think I am, uh, my, my special character is, is like sometimes really quiet, sometimes really not quiet. <laughs> so, so I have, uh, you know, double, many layers of, of my, uh, this is the beginning. So how is it like for you, I mean, over the years, let's start from, you know, your days with, uh, you know, TV dramas, uh, Oscar winning uh, award movies. Uh, those were the very start, right? I think we are the, um, you know, the generation of, of movie actually. So we educate, we learn how to be a man, how to be, uh, you know, getting everything from movie. It's almost like that, you know, identity, everything from movie. Mm -hmm. uh, especially in the 60s, right? Every, everyone thinking about philosophy, meaning of life and everything. Um, so I, I think I was influenced by that period uh, of art in French, New Wave, a lot. So Fanini and Gauder and everyone. So uh, I'm I still there, I think. I want to create something new, create the angles of seeing life and share the experiences. Mm -hmm. The most important thing of movie is to share the life experience. So um, I really hope people can, uh, you know, to share my work of happiness. And then, you know, it, it's not just happiness. It, it's something to, to touch your heart and then make you feel strong. In one of the interviews you did earlier, maybe several years ago, you talk about today, there's such a lack of art or artistic yeah. uh, that you want to bring it back. Yeah. Can we still find it back? Of course, I, I feel really positive. Because you are living in the spiritual world, but you you thinking you are living in a material world, <laughs> that's the problem. <laughs> Does the internet help, or the other way around? Mm, Technology. This is not about it's not about the media itself. It's it's about the goals. It's about how how drive you to move. What is the tension? What is the motive? Why are you doing this? It, it's not about the media. It's about the content. We have to, but people is not that strong in energy, so that you, we have to, like artists, we have to doing something. It's like an art installation. Own little universe in a way. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wonder how much does that have to do with age, with growing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. both as a man and as an artist. Yeah, I think it's give up. Give up is the way. When to you give up, up you, you have to, you have, get away the weight so that you have the lightness, so that you, you can rise up and you see something different. <laughs> I think my attitude has never changed, uh, but I'm becoming more mature, can be you know, more easy to communicate, I mean. And, um, but you know, some things are not changing. It's like Andy t talk about me after Oscar, and if you me, I, I, I didn't change anything for my character. <laughs> It's always muddy and, you know, like, all the time concentrate on what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, I, I don't think I will change. Yeah. There's something there that's never going to change. No, no, no. There, what there's, is there's, it? There's, there's like an air. So <laughs> and, like, and the electric start to be a problem. Mm. The computer always have problem. Mm. <laughs> 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 Tim, I think I know you much better today. <laughs> and thank you for this effort you made yeah, 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 sure. to present to us different layers of you in order to find all of us. Mm -mm -mm, yeah. That's thank you I'm so doing. much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insights CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for more insights across China and around the world. The weekend is here. Time to take it easy and have a great one. Bye for now.